Ron, welcome to the show. It's great to be back. What is it, like three years ago, I think last time we had you on, I had a newborn right out of the gate and now almost a four-year-old. I can't believe it. And you got a, a, a handful of kids of varying ages. Is that right? I've got a ninth grader and I've got a kindergartner. And I'm now dying to ask whether your little one is asking you money questions yet. Is it happening? Is it starting? Uh, a little bit. Mostly right. it's about, you know, Paw Patrol, ogres and trolls, but uh, <laughs> we're, we're, we're getting there. Um, and Moana, Moana right now. Uh -huh. um, you know, your book, listeners, uh, we'll post this to the show note links. The last time we talked, uh, we talked about one of my favorite personal finance books, The Opposite of Spoiled which applies not just to kids, but also to us big kids too. And you got a new book out called The Price You Pay for College. Congrats on the new book. How'd you, you just had all this time during quarantine, just thought you'd write another book? Ah, I wish that was how it went. In fact, the time during quarantine, which I very much did not have because we lost a ton of childcare for the kindergartner mm -hmm. and the demands at my day job to write about personal finance at the New York Times approximately quintupled in terms of the demand for my services. Uh, no, what I was actually doing during that time with my third arm or my fourth arm was revising the book that was already done. Uh, I'd pressed save on it. We were sort of ready to go like the first week in March. And then we were like, shit, <laughs> we're, yeah. we're not going to be able to, we're not going to be able to do this right now. Um, we need to, we need to wait and see what happened. And so we hit the pause button and thought, okay, this will all be over, right? This will all be over in September when everybody goes back to school. Uh, and in, you know, in the next couple of months, it became clear that it really was going to be over in Taiwan, South Korea, China, Australia, other countries, right? But not here. And so here we are. So I had to figure out how to essentially write through the manuscript in anticipation of what would happen when people came back to school and also in, in anticipation of what kind of shopping decisions, different ones, uh, that parents were gonna need to make now that it was clear that we really have no idea when this will be over. Well, what was the inspiration? Was it your 14 year old sort of coming in age, getting ready for this whole process? Was it something that uh, you got feedback from the columns you wrote where people were like, this is just such a uh, impossible, unbearable, complicated situation? What, what was kind of the origin story? Well, the real origin story goes back to when I was in high school and applying for college and applying for need-based financial aid myself. And we ran into a, a guy running this incredible side hustle. He was the assistant director for financial aid at Northwestern University, but he had the side business going where he was taking cash from local families and essentially telling them how to beat the financial aid system, you know, mm -hmm. how to fill out the financial aid forms and, and, you know, do it all right and how to appeal and, you know, the things that nobody tells you. Uh, if you don't find an expert. And so in some ways, it's it's no big surprise that I grew up to be a personal finance writer, somebody whose beat is beating the system, you know, having en encountered Roger Kester back in the fall of 1988 and having him helped me work my way through all of that stuff, right? So fast forward a bunch of years, I become a dad, start saving in a 529 account, like a good little personal finance writer, start writing for the Wall Street Journal at the time about how to save for college, a couple of years later, I get to the New York Times. A whole bunch of people are washing out during the recession with you know $100,000 in undergraduate loans. What the hell happened there, right? So I start writing about how to pay for college or how not to pay for college, as the case may be. Flash forward another four, five, six, seven years. I'm starting to age into the cohort where my friends from college and high school, some of my peers in the workplace, and you know a whole bunch of readers having sensed my interest in this topic, um, are all approaching college with their own kids if they were early breeders or earlier than me, right? Or early adopters. And they're saying a couple things. First of all, Ron, nobody raised a flag and told me that the flagship state university in my state had passed $100,000 for four years. What the hell happened here? That's outrageous, right? Or the private college that my parents managed to pay for 25, 30 years ago, it's now over $300,000. And I'm not sure my kid can get in, but even if my kid can get in, even if I do have the ability to pay, I'm not sure I should have the willingness. So they said, your paper, the New York Times, doesn't shut up about how we live in the era of big data. Where is the big data set that tells me why 
Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois, is $100,000 better than Kenyon College at a discount in Ohio, and why Kenyon is $100,000 better than the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana. And I said, I don't know. Uh, I don't think that data set exists. And then it occurred to me in a flash, you big dummy, you've been spilling all of this ink over how to save for college and how to pay for college, but you miss the most important question of all, what to pay for college. You miss the value question, right? And now that this thing has spiraled past $300,000 for four years, if you don't get any discounts and you've got a couple of kids, pretty soon it starts looking like the biggest financial decision your family will ever make. And not only is it, is it the biggest, right? But we've got a giant pile of money involved. We've got a whole bunch of complexity uh, we've got a system that's partially opaque, and we've got a whole bunch of feelings getting in the way of level-headed decision-making because as ever, money equals feelings, right? So this felt like my sweet spot, right? Big numbers, lots of complexity, lots of feelings. These are the things that I like to write about. And moreover, um, it felt like a new personal finance question altogether. And we don't get those very often, right? You know, in the world of investing and the world of personal finance broadly, we don't see a whole lot of new questions. But the question of what to pay for college, that felt like a new one. And it felt like one that I could not answer in one newspaper column or 10 or 15 or 20. And that's why I wrote yeah. the book. You know, <clears throat> I imagine every listener is, is just rewinding back to their time when, when they were at school or even thinking about their current situation with their kids or having been through it. And it brings up so many memories. Uh, you know, people love to think in terms of personal finance being black and white. Um, hey, here's how you optimize a portfolio. Here's how you should take out a loan to do this, that, and the other. This is how you should pay down debt, you know. But the squishy, uh, like you said back, uh, money equals feelings is such a important part of it. I mean, if you were to list the reasons why I ended up choosing the school that I did, uh, a lot of it, honestly, was it was like the most picture perfect, beautiful spring day. Uh, you know, there's my, my tour guide was a beautiful girl in sundress. Like, like, you know, none of those reasons were where the engineering school ranked. <laughs> so um, <laughs> there's so much involved in it. Uh, we're going to kind of walk through a lot. My, my, my first um, question is, I mean, it seems like college and universities are such a big business. What, what's changed? And then we'll kind of talk about the, the state of affairs today and then walk through this whole, whole darn thing. Yeah, so there's a lot in there, right? Um, first of all, we are correct to discuss it as an industry. We should treat it as such. We should analyze it as such. We should shop it as such, right? And we should look at its marketing schemes as such. As to the question of what has changed, I'm not sure there is any industry in the United States of America, or maybe even on earth, that has changed less than residential undergraduate education in a generation. Some of the buildings are nicer, newer, maybe a little more technology in the classrooms. Um, but other than that, it's kind of the same, right? Not a lot of new majors. A lot of the professors, the same people who were there uh, 30 years ago, uh, a lot of the buildings are, you know, look the same. Um, can you name a single residential undergraduate institution in the United States of America of note that has come into existence in the past generation that is nonprofit? I mean, you can count on you can count them on half of one hand, essentially, and the ones that I'm thinking of are at least 20 years old. So. Not much new, right? But, but if you look over on the pricing side, that's where things have changed a lot. And this is where otherwise sophisticated people get really screwed up and screwed over, right? Because they kind of look at what they're getting from their alumni societies if they went to college, or they look at what they're seeing on the tours, and it all looks kind of familiar and kind of similar from place to place. But the pricing, wow, has the pricing changed. Um, and that is what people need to be concerned with. And when you say pricing, you mean going up, right? <laughs> well, or is it, or is it, talk, talk, tell us about it. If if this was simpler, I wouldn't have felt compelled to write a book. So let's see if we can break it down. First of all, the list price, 
that's what you're referring to. And when we say that the flagship state universities now quote unquote cost uh, $25,000 per year or more all in, including room and board before a discount, right? That's what we're talking about. The retail price, the rack rate. Ditto the private colleges and universities. At the University of Chicago, it is now $80,000 per year, per year. Right, so 325 essentially at a minimum if you're paying full price and, and lots of folks are there. So that's the list price. Then if we are to talk about averages overall, if you look at private colleges and universities on average, they are discounting their tuitions by 52%. Which seems crazy to a lot of people and, and sort of unbelievable, right? But we're talking about averages and we're talking about all the private colleges and universities in America. Now, you are not average. Your kid is, of course, above average, way above average, right? And the institutions you're thinking about for your above average kid are themselves above average in selectivity, prestige, whatever, right? I mean, this, this, is, this is how it goes with, with many parents, particularly many parents of younger children who have high aspirations for them. So what exactly is going on at those schools? Well, it depends. So let's go back to Ron Lieber, 1988. He's applying for need-based financial aid. That system, still pretty similar to the old system. Depends on your income, depends on your assets. You gotta fill out this thing called the FAFSA. And if you're applying for a private college or university, you probably have to fill out a second form called the CSS profile. School sizes you up, decides how, if it wants you at all. And then sometimes it decides how much it wants you and apportions your need-based aid accordingly. And maybe there's gonna be more loans in that package, or maybe they're gonna be more grants that you don't have to pay back. And then you've got to decide whether that looks affordable to you. So that itself is not simple. Trying to predict what kind of offer you'll get from a school, uh, also not simple. You've got to fill out this thing called the net price calculator that every school maintains to try and even get an estimate of the offer they might make. And then that might change if your data changes or obviously if you filled out that calculator wrong. This is the simple part. The less simple part is something known as merit aid. And that is a separate parallel track of financial aid that has hived itself off from the old-fashioned need-based system. And that exists along essentially a parallel set of train tracks. And sometimes the train crosses over in complicated ways that we won't even get into now, right? But merit aid works like so. Best to think about it as a couponing scheme, a marketing scheme, a form of leverage. Uh, the way it began in earnest um, was in the 1990s in states like Ohio, where there are a lot of above average, but not super elite private colleges and universities. And the schools at the bottom of that particular food chain didn't like where they were because people with the ability to pay were questioning whether they should have the willingness to pay the ever rising list prices. So these schools said, we, we gotta get out of the, the bottom of the Ohio tier here. So we're gonna go out and buy a bunch of really good teenagers. And when teenagers of above average academic prowess applied to those institutions, or when those institutions went out and solicited people with better PSAT scores by buying their names from the college board and sending a bunch of mail, they started throwing $5,000 and $10,000 at them, giant piles of green cash money, essentially, right, in the form of a discount. And it worked so well that the other institutions who were losing their students to these institutions that were trying to buy their way up the prestige ladder, right? So they would improve their standing at US News and more people who were willing to pay would, would actually apply. They started responding competitively. And then farther up the food chain, others needed to respond. And so, you know, flash forward 20 years, every single school in America, except the 50 or 60 most selective ones, now have to offer some form of this merit aid. I, lo you know, I loved your, I loved your, uh, was the Alabama example where they got into like, yeah, a, like a, right. a bidding, bidding war essentially. So it's, right. And like, it, you know, we so wish this was simpler, but like to break it down even more, you've got to think about like what's happening with the privates and what's happening with the publics. So if you think about the privates, there's a sort of demarcation line and, you know, slightly above it is, um, you know, Carleton College in Minnesota and Swarthmore uh, outside of Philadelphia. You know, certainly the, the Ivy League, uh, you know, Colby College in Maine. These schools do not have to throw money 
at kids who have the ability to pay, but not the willingness and have extra high grades. They don't have to do it. But Oberlin, they got to do it. Occidental in LA, they got to do it. Um, uh, Kenyon College in Ohio, uh, they have to do it. Even Duke University does a little bit of this. And at the University of Southern California, at Tulane University in New Orleans, Northeastern University in Boston, they have made not just an art, but a science of this and have bought themselves to a spot in the market using this tuition leverage as a form of marketing um, for where they were a safety, safety schools or commuter schools a generation ago. And now all those schools only accept, you know, 14, 16, 18, 20% of their students. They did it brilliantly. And on the public side, they decided they should get in the act too, right? States uh, cut their subsidies to the schools during the last recession. And the schools are like, what are we going to do, right? We could jack the tuition on, on in-state residents, but we only have so many in-state residents. Oh, let's market ourselves as a super cool place to go to school from people far away who used to be able to, you know, get into Cornell or get into Tulane, but can't anymore. And let's go out and buy them. Right. So Alabama did this brilliantly. They raised their out of tuition uh, 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 list price to the sky. And then they started throwing $20,000 coupons at above average mm. students from Long Island and, and suburban Chicago, making everybody feel good about themselves. Parents get a gold star. They managed to lure them down there for a visit. And they're like, wow, Southern hospitality. This is a beautiful place. They've got an amazing football team. And they're going to make me an honor student, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and we can walk around saying that we got an academic scholarship for five years and I can put that on my resume. So many people left the state of Illinois that the state legislature had to cough up $25 million annually to create a fund to buy home state students back from Alabama. I love that. This That's is how so Meridade works. <laughs> And so who's paying the rack rate? Is it is oversimplification? Is it just wealthy, um, slightly uh, lower uh, academic scoring students? Is that right? Yeah. So again, much depends on where you are uh, in, in the food chain. I mean, you can think about it in kind of rank order of selectivity, right? Percentage of um, percentage of students that uh, a school is accepting. If a school is accepting under 25% of its students, under 30% of its students, it's probably not offering much of any merit aid. And maybe 50% of the people are paying full price, maybe a little more, maybe a little less. And so, you know, it's a bunch of families with household incomes of two fifty, three dollars $300,000 a year or more. Um, and a lot of international families in increasing numbers, although there was a, a pause during the Trump era, um, they very much want to send their kids to the United States for what they perceived to be, you know, an A grade, A plus uh, education abroad. Um, uh, but then you go farther down the food chain and it's, you know, a lower and lower percentage of parents who are both able to pay full price and willing to do so, right? At Oberlin, right? At Kenyon, at McAllister College in St. Paul, uh, maybe it's 10 or 20 or 30% of people paying full price. Then you go the next tier down the food chain of selectivity, and it's a single digit percentage of people who are paying, mostly international. Sometimes um, it's uh, alumni parents who are extremely wealthy and whose kids were like marginal in terms of their admissibility. And so, you know, they've got these checks that they're writing from the bank of thank God, you know, they're like, thank God my kid got in. I'm happy to write you a large check, uh, you know, so that my kid can go to go to the alma mater. And uh, you know, occasional other um, situations like that, uh, and then one step more down the food chain, there are all these private colleges where 100% of the people are getting a discount, which seems sort of nuts when you think about it. I was smiling and thinking about um, back when the scandals were going on, like last year, whenever this was, ten years. I, it's, this last year has been so long. I think it was last year. <laughs> I don't even know. Um, someone on Twitter was like, "You know what? One of these colleges should do, which they never will." They'll be like, look, 1% of our students, enough of this back scratching, donate, whatever, you're, you're a fake uh, scholarship on the field hockey team. We're going to straight up auction the top 100 or 1% spots. And you want to pay $10 million, a year, whatever it is, in the top, you know, and just make it explicit and say, we'll just do that. Of course, no one's going to do that. But I thought that was a, a wonderful free market idea that would probably raise millions of dollars. But alas, maybe, maybe we'll see it one day. Well, no, but, but it wasn't crazy at all because that already goes on, right? That's how Jared Kushner got to go to Harvard, 
that's how all sorts of kids, um, you know, all really rich kids get to go to Ivy League schools because their parents make donations. And it's essentially, a, you know, a tit for tat. And Daniel Golden um, proved it in a fantastic book he, he wrote a decade ago, essentially documenting all of this, right? Um, so, you know, one of the ironies of that scandal was that there were all sorts of people who were essentially paying bribes to the institution, but doing so legally and nobody had a problem with it. Um, but then there was this illegal way that the grubby lower half of the 1% you know, was using to get in because uh, they didn't have the seven figure amounts to, to buy the buildings you know, that the upper half of the 1% did and they went to jail. So, you know, America, right? <laughs> yeah, you know, um... It's needlessly complicated, as you mentioned, you know, as we talk about um, even 20 years ago, I, I recall there being essentially only two pieces of information you could find back then, which was US News World Report ranking and maybe best value. And that was probably it. Uh, everything else was kind of uh, at the mercy of your guidance counselor, or, or like you said, if you found a lucky to uh, have a free agent or someone who's been through it. Um, how should someone, so example, in, in your seat or parents out there, uh, what's the time, when do they start preparing and how do they do it? You know, you have a whole section of your book on hacks and things to think about that dispel, I think, a lot of ideas and, and um, common misconceptions. But walk us through kind of, all right, so little Johnny's going to college, hopefully. When do we start thinking about it? How do we start preparing and, and what's the best practices? Yeah, so I mean, let me try to answer that question this way because the real answer to your question is just way too long for a podcast and it involves like 20 steps. I was annoyed, frankly, and not only that I had to write this book but that it had to be so long. I, I wanted it to be short. The chapters are really short, right? And you can bounce around all you want. I tried to make it super readable but there's just a lot to do. There's too much to do. How much is there to do? Well, I mean, look, you're somebody who appreciates markets more than most. In the last couple of years, not one, not two, not three, but four startups, for-profit startups have emerged to try to begin to sort out this madness for people, mm -hmm. this like pricing and discounting and merit aid and what the hell is going on and am I getting a good deal or not? And Smart. What, am I, what am I missing? Four startups, right? Trying to solve for this, trying to make it so that nobody has to read my book um, and they can just use <laughs> software and other people's experience um, to, to kind of benefit themselves. Um, so, uh, you know, a partial answer to your question is that you really do have to start sooner, um, which I know makes me sound like a type A freaked out helicopter parenting nut job. And, you know, we all have a little bit of that in us, but the unfortunate reality is, is that this stuff is just complicated. Um, and the pricing system is complicated and you want to get educated on how the system works, you know, when your kid is in seventh and eighth grade, right? Because you begin to sort of lay the, lay the track work down and, and lay the record down, your kid does, um, starting, in, uh, starting in ninth grade. And as a parent uh, in middle school at the latest, you probably want to begin to have a sense uh, for yourself uh, and with your spouse, if you have one, and with your ex, if you've got one of those, because you really don't want to be fighting about it when the kid's in high school, about what you're able to pay, which is a personal finance question, and what you're willing to pay, which is both a value question and a values question. So these are complicated things, right? Not simple. And the dollar amounts are large. So it pays literally to begin to figure out how the system works and, and how you want to play in it when your kid is in middle school. Why? Well, I, I think you owe your kid an explanation by the time they start high school. They should know the rules of this ridiculous game. And, um, you know, as much as I'd like to burn the system, um, that's not something I can do alone. And burning a system this big takes decades usually. Uh, I'm just trying to help people beat the system. And you have to start sooner than most people think. Well, and that, that makes sense. I mean, that's like anything in personal finance, you know, the saving, investing, the big muscle movements, the, the earlier you start, the better. And um, also with, with everything involved with money, you know, expectations are so important. Like having those conversations, I mean, so many families, you know, money is such a taboo topic. No one wants to talk about it. I remember the, our last conversation, we were talking about the dad who came out 
uh, came home and put all the money on the table. So this is how much we pay for rent. This is how much we pay for insurance, you know, and just trying to make it tangible because um, kids don't know. I mean, and, and my number one complaint, I, I complain about on Twitter, almost on the, the weekly, uh, maybe daily, is we don't teach personal finance in school. And so, so many people are just unequipped to even have a, you know, that whole other podcast, right? So um, parents too. Anyway, assuming you have the beginnings of this, having those conversations, because worst possible scenario is little Johnny gets into some super expensive school and has his heart set on it, little, you know, tears in his eyes, mom, dad, like it means the world to me and you can't say no. Next thing you know, you've co-signed into a more debt that you could ever afford for the rest of your life. Walk us through, okay, you got a 529, you start saving, but kind of walk us through like, what are some of the things you could be doing, thinking about the main muscle movements about, hey, these are the type of aid packages I should be hiding income in Bermuda in the next six years. Like, you know, what, what, what can yeah. we be doing? Sure. I, I mean, I think it's helpful to, you know, once you've established what you think you may be able to pay and what you may be willing to pay. And, and I get that knowing what you're willing to pay may depend on, you know, what kind of high school student you end up with and, you know, what these schools seem to have an offer on offer for your, your idiosyncratic um, kid. And, and every kid is idiosyncratic in some way, but you at least need to frame the discussion. Right. Um, and it can't be as, you know, wrote as like trying to come up with some maxim, like great or state, right? Like we won't pay more than the state university unless it's great. Well, how are you going to define great, right? Great, great, great according to whose measure? Great for, for what kind of kid? Um, it, it just depends, right? So, you know, I so wanted there to be some kind of magic algorithm that I'd be able to come up with where everybody could feed in their money and feelings and out would spout, you know, pay no more than $204,000 for Kenyon College in Ohio and no more than $178,000 in Occidental in Los Angeles. But that's it, right? And definitely don't pay full price at the University of Alabama out of state. Mm -hmm. um, I wish it was that simple. Um, instead, uh, you know, I think you need to begin to take your kid's temperature, you know, starting in ninth grade try to get a sense of, you know, is this a, is this a kid who's going to thrive in an urban environment, in a rural environment? Is that not going to matter? Is this a kid who's going to be okay at a big school with a lot of choices in really large classes where they might never meet a professor until junior or senior year? Is this a kid who has intense academic interests where, you know, the learning, the, the mind blowing and the mind growing process of being in the classroom is going to be paramount? Is this a kid who is going to graduate at 22 and work in our family business? And they're going to start as a salesperson for five years. And we don't really care what they learn at college. We don't really care what kind of credential they have. What we care is that this kid of ours becomes a people person, right? And, and, and we'll teach this kid everything they need to know about the business. And so maybe then, right, what you really want is for the kid to go to the flagship state university or, or, you know, the second or the third one and join the most socially active, sorry, the, mm -hmm. to, to join, not socially active in a political sense, join the fraternity or sorority with the best parties, right? <laughs> because those are... Um, are going to be the kids who are extroverts and they're going to come out um, and they're likely to be the most affluent. And uh, my kid is going to come out of that, you know, fraternity or sorority experience with an amazing, you know, list of, of connections an awesome LinkedIn profile. And those are going to be, you know, the prospects at the top of our sales funnel and that network that our kid has bought him or herself, you know, with our tuition money uh, at Michigan State University, uh, you know, or at, uh, um, at the University of Wisconsin or at Texas A&M, right? That's going to be, that's, that's what we're paying for. So, so much depends, right, on, on what it is you're trying to get out of it and how you're defining college. It's hard to, you know, because the parents often have uh, different incentives and goals than the kids do. And, and also, look, these kids are 17 years old. And in many cases, I mean, thinking back to all my friends, how many are actually doing even what their undergraduate degree, you know, 
half less the quarter 10 percent um and you know it's just it's hard to know the best thing you do is is make a you know educated guess um so uh, let's say you have the conversation you start to identify some of the potential candidates and, and what's at least within the realm of possibility um for the majority of people and we hear so much in the headlines about college debt right like it's just like this uh, national crisis um maybe walk us through, you know, is it a crisis? What is the uh, characteristics of this sort of borrowing, assuming you have to borrow to go to college in some format, like best practices, just talk, walk us through that whole part of the world. Yeah. So, you know, Again, a, this is like a third of the book. So listeners, you gotta, <laughs> you gotta go for the uh, you want the whole kimono, you got to get the book, but uh, give us give us some of the highlights. Yeah, so let's talk about the economy and then let's talk about the individual. When we think about student debt and, and we think about the economy, um, I mean, let, let's, let's start by being honest about what's actually going on here. Um, we are in the middle of conducting a 1.7 trillion with a T, 1.7 trillion dollar generation long economic experience, experiment with no real you know, social controls, uh, or not many of them. Uh, and we're using children as the guinea pigs, right? Because they are under 18 when they apply for college and they fill out their financial aid forms. That sucks, right? Yeah. Fuck that, excuse my yeah. French, right? Yeah. Um, that's not how we ought to be operating. Uh, and so if you wonder why, uh, a bunch of people in the Biden administration are thinking about slicing off ten thousand dollars in in everybody's debt with the um, uh, you know the stroke of a of a pen via executive order, uh, and why they're calling it cancellation and not forgiveness. Right? Forgiveness implies that somebody did something wrong, but most of these teenagers got into debt because the schools and our nation were telling them to do so, and the government was in fact handing them the money, right? Cancellation implies that maybe we as a nation got it wrong. Like maybe this is, wasn't the way that we ought to be doing things. Um, so with that rambling preamble, there are all sorts of people who are in default on their student loan debts who have under $10,000 in debt. Their credit is wrecked, they are off the grid. Uh, it's not like the education department and the cheapskates that it hires um, to track and service these loans are doing a great job of tracking people down. Because if they could, they could get them enrolled in repayment programs and repair, repair their credit. But so much of the debt that's in default um, is under, uh, or so many of the people, the units, right? The units of default are people with not a lot of student loan debt. If we wipe away $10,000 for everybody, all those people are, are back in good graces eventually with their credit reports. Uh, so why did that happen? How did that happen? Well, we do a terrible job of tracking them. We make people do too much that's too complex um, to you know, sort of stay on the books with their loan servicers. Um, and a lot of those folks got taken in by for-profit schools and then dropped out after a semester midway through. Um, and so they've got the debt, but, but none of the benefit that comes from getting a degree. So I worry about them the most. Then there are a bunch of you know, veterinarians and chiropractors who've got $378,000 in student loan debt. And you know, those people were grownups who borrowed uh, knowing exactly what they were getting into. And you know, most of them have six figure incomes and uh, are probably gonna end up being okay. Um, as for the everyday undergraduate, um, as long as they don't borrow more than the federal student loan limit. So as long as they don't go out with their parents, get their parents to co-sign a loan and get a private loan tune, as long as you stay under the you know, $31,000, $32,000 that the federal student loan program will let you borrow, you're good. Is that most? As long as, as, long as, you, as, long as you finish the degree. I think the average debt is maybe 25, 26. So, so a lot of most... people max out. Yeah, and um, two thirds of people who go to college end up borrowing something. Um, so uh, the reason why that's safe is that there are all sorts of income-driven repayment programs that only apply to federal student loan debt. So if you get into trouble, you can get yourself into one of those relatively easily, as long as you know to do so, which a lot of people don't. Uh, and then your income gets uh, your your payment gets adjusted according to your income until you're back on your feet. 
Um, so that's about how it breaks down. That's about as simple a, as I can put it. Um, where it gets complicated is, you know, for the people who are required to have master's degrees for low paid jobs or lower paying jobs like teaching or um, becoming a social worker, um, you know, and they end up with another 50 grand in debt, that gets complicated. And, you know, the bigger macro questions that hang over us besides the ethics of conducting a $1.7 trillion um, experiment on children, um, you know, the other thing that hangs over us is like just how much are people delaying or foregoing business formation, home purchases, uh, having a second child or having a third one? I mean, these are all things that matter a lot to our economy. And it is very difficult to separate student loan debt out from all the other factors that might weigh on someone before they chuck their day job and start a company or before you know they lay down 25 grand in, in down payment funds. And so there are a lot of you know, strong suspicions that as the nation's student loan debt balance rises ever higher, that we are doing some damage um, to our economy. But the evidence is not crystal clear and where the evidence seems strong, it's just not, it's, it's not completely clear how big of an overarching impact it's having. So, this is a, a tough question because obviously the subject is so emotionally charged. Um, we talked about few on the blog uh, the other day, unrelated to, to this topic, but about policy ideas in general for personal finance. Um, so, and you can pick from either private market or public policy, you know, do you have any general suggestions about like the system is clearly antiquated? Uh, like many, it's been built patchwork over a hundred years and there's a lot of, vested interests, like what would help kind of fix this uh, whole uh, whole system? Well, I, you know, given that I write a column and it is a column, right, you know, for the New York Times, I, I, it's on the news pages and not on the opinion pages. And so mm -hmm. to a certain extent, they try to keep me muzzled when I'm uh, out here in, in public with, without, the, without the leash uh, or without an editor looking over my shoulder. But there are nonpartisan policy solutions that are eminently sensible that we haven't tried yet, right? Um, and so it makes very little sense um, that the federal government has now lent out, you know, well over a trillion dollars, and we don't have an automatic repayment system that's, you know, duct taped to the IRS, um, where everybody just pays back, you know, X percent of their income until Y number of years have gone by, or you know, some other formula that just applies to everybody and, and is fair. Right, the fact that there are all of these third-party loan servicers in the background, and that more often than not they don't treat people very well, maybe because we don't pay them enough, because we as taxpayers, you know, want the best possible deal, but we're getting too good of a deal, uh, you know, all of that nonsense, all of that red tape and and infrastructure and extra steps and administrative burden, you know, screw that, right? Yeah. We could simplify this. We could make it easy. Australia, Australia did it many years ago now. It's all right there for the taking. Everybody would win if we did that. But we don't have the political will. Why don't we have the political will? Well, you know, people in their 20s don't vote as much um, and they haven't shouted loudly enough um, for changes. And how do we get people to do that? And would politicians listen? And, and uh, you know, this is a this is a bigger question. It's a bigger problem that we have, uh, you know, vis-a-vis -vis our elected representatives and their ability to actually do stuff, any stuff. Yeah. We uh, that was actually one of our suggestions in my piece. I'll send it to you later. But we said Australia is also the gold medal example when it comes to retirement funds, where they just say, "Look, we understand something behaviorally, which is we're going to straight up opt you in. Like, too bad, ten percent of your ten percent of your income." And the funny, everyone in Australia loves it. You talk to someone in Australia, they're like, oh, "I love my super. It's amazing. I have this massive balance because it's been growing for thirty anyway." Um, Aussies, we uh, we need your help. Um, twenty twenty. Uh, obviously a, a massive uh, neutron bomb went off in the, in the education space. Um, is this going to change anything in a positive way? I do not see it as an accelerant at all. And here's why. All we have to do is look at how people behaved. In March, a whole bunch of people 
everybody essentially um, were sent home really quickly. And right away, it became clear that people didn't like what was going on at all. The, if you think going to college is something that people do for three reasons, which I do, right? You know, the education, the kinship and the credential, the education got a lot worse real fast, right? People didn't like that. And the kinship essentially disappeared, right? Your peers are scattered to the winds. Your professor is wherever he or she is. You know, it's hard to, to form or maintain a mentorship relationship. Um, so all that's gone. The only thing's left is, is the credential. And, you know, you get some like electronic notification and, and pose in a cap and gown on your front lawn after you've come out of your parents' basement. I mean, the whole thing sucked, right? So was it any surprise at all that against all public health reason and, and against a, a lot of economic reason, given how compromised the fall of 2020 was clearly going to be, that all of these students and their parents, right, were just clamoring to come back. Why was that exactly? Well, I think the reason why that was is that because residential undergraduate education, residential residential undergraduate education has come to be seen as a rite of passage in the United States, so much so that it hasn't had to change one lick in a generation, as we were discussing earlier. And not only that, even amid a pandemic, when it was pretty clear that a whole bunch of people were going to get sick, and they did, right, even when it became clear that professors were not going to come to class, and they didn't, even when it became clear that there was going to be no sex, fewer drugs and not a lot of rock and roll at these places, right? People came back anyway. That suggests to me that people really like this. In fact, the middle-class teenagers and above treat it sort of like an entitlement. So will there be a steam locomotive of, you know, technology and VC money that comes and, you know, obliterates it the way that it's obliterated nearly every other industry? I, you know, I wouldn't rule it out, but is it going to happen by the time my ninth grader is going to college? I don't think so, right? And there are all sorts of fantastic online educational technologies that already work really well. And most of them weren't even tried uh, in the spring. They're used for people who are 47, who have decided to finally go back and finish their degree or, or get a new one. Uh, you know, and they do that part-time online at night and it's awesome for them. Uh, but that's not what 18 year olds are shopping for. And I don't think we're about to see a sea change where 18 year olds are gonna be shopping for something different. And right, think about who the consumer of the product is of residential undergraduate education. The consumer of the product, graduate schools and entry level employers, right? So unless and until graduate students, uh, graduate schools and entry level employers start asking for, and in fact, preferring the product of an entirely new form of undergraduate education that has yet to come into existence, unless and until that happens at some kind of mass scale, such that the parents paying the bills are willing to take a chance on something else entirely, even if their kids want it, I don't think we're gonna see a sea change. Yeah, a um, couple quick topics and we're gonna let you go. Um, ISAs, income sharing agreements, a positive, a negative, debt by another name, not a big deal. Uh, what's your uh, what's your takeaways? I think it's interesting that they emerged in, in force, at least at Purdue University. Purdue is an interesting case study, and I'm pretty sure they're only doing it there with certain degrees. And here's why, all right? Federal student loan limit, roughly $30,000, $32,000 for most undergraduates. If you are an engineer at Purdue, Maybe you're from out of state. Maybe it's going to take you four and a half years. Maybe that higher tuition is causing some strain on your family, but you're getting A's and B's. You've had great internships. And you know that when you get out, you're going to be earning 80 to $100,000 a year. And you just need another $10,000. At that point, signing up for an income share agreement makes a fair bit of sense, might even be a better deal than a private loan, which would just create you know, more complexity in your financial life. And so for those folks, is that a, you know, a reasonable deal? Um, it's certainly a worthwhile experiment, right? Um, but you know, as with all of these experiments that we're performing on 
teenagers, right? Let's just not forget what we're doing here. Uh, you know, I'm not sure this one should also turn into a trillion dollar experiment, not at least until we have, you know, a couple decades of data about how it affects decision making later on. Yeah, well, you mentioned startups in the space of, um, you know, the, the software side trying to help you with these decisions. Um, I mean, you've, you're, I've seen at least a dozen, maybe two dozen in the ISA space, and they're of every possible flavor, some in South America. Obviously, the Lambda School is the most famous for the software side, uh, nurses targeted. Um, like you mentioned, it'll be interesting to see it developed, and hopefully it's positive. You know, you never know with these things, but um, at least we're trying something. I don't know. It, uh, it seems a little bit like a mess. I'll be, I'll be curious to know if any of these software companies you've seen on the the whole application side develop, it seems like an obvious aid. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm optimistic. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll chat more about that. Um, what was the big, you know, I, your book gave me a little FOMO. It took me a lot back to, to university. We didn't have a lazy river. Um, we did have a really nice aquatic center. Virginia was a beautiful campus. It's what I think, of, you know, college, like you think of this beautiful trees everywhere. Um, most people, when they get think of school being expensive, they think of, buildings and like, you know, huge college uh, football coach salaries or whatnot. But you mentioned in the book that it was actually, it's a lot of just the business of managing the school, the teachers, right? Um, a lot of the, just actually running the school. Long-winded intro to what, what was the, what have you seen as the weirdest or most uh, luxurious extravagant perk? Is there anything that you're just like, oh man, I shook my head. That was, that was, that's odd for a undergraduate university to be having. Well, here's one. So High Point University, have you ever heard of High Point University? Yes, but that's because I went to high school about 20 minutes away in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Huh. So <laughs> I, 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 I know where it is. I don't know anything more about it. Do you know what's happened there? No. So uh, it was turned upside down and, and inside out by uh, a new president uh, 10, 12, 14 years ago, who came in, borrowed a bunch of money, built a bunch of new buildings and a whole bunch of great amenities and basically made it a, um, a, a school for um, people who want their kids to live in the manner to which they've become accustomed and prepare themselves hardcore, you know, for, for business careers and pharmacy careers and, and things like that. And they've tripled the number of undergraduates. They have six or seven swimming pools. There's an on-campus steakhouse where you can use your meal card that is in effect a place you go to, you know, learn manners and decorum. And, um, and this is what they did, right? So um, the thing that I found most interesting, maybe most interesting, and, and the tour at High Point, this is in High Point, North Carolina, anybody who's a, you know, anthropological student of this sort of thing, uh, ought to, to, to go and go and see it. Uh, you know, if you're going, going to visit Duke or going to visit Wake Forest, going to see Chapel Hill, take a side trip to High Point. It's, it's like a tourist attraction at this point. Um, there is a concierge in the student union. And as an undergraduate, you can stop at the concierge and ask for stuff ask questions about the shuttle to town, book a free ride to the airport, you know, whatever, whatever you want, you can, you can ask the concierge and it's the concierge's job to help you. And at first glance, I thought, you know, this is ridiculous, <laughs> right? I've never seen anything like this. Uh, what does this say about what this place stands for? But then a, a bunch of months later, I had cause to interview one of the concierges and she said, oh, this is the hardest job to get on campus. And I'm thinking to myself, what? Wait, wait, what? And I said, well, wait, why is that true? And she said, because the concierges get more out of this job than the students do. And I said, explain that to me. And she said, well, she said, you've got anything and everything coming at you here on any given day. So you've got to have a ton of knowledge, a ton of flexibility, you know, a customer service orientation, um, you know, a little bit of the, the salesperson in you because you want this job to continue to exist. So you want to, you know, provide value to the user and, um, you know, you want them to feel good about the transaction. 
She said, I learned a ton. I use those skills all the time. She now has a you know, terrific job in, in PR in New York City, which was her career goal. And she got, she got there within 12 months having graduated from High Point. And I thought, wow, um, I was kind of a jerk, uh, you know, in the way that I responded to that. This isn't about necessarily trying to make it appear as if um, this place is the Four Seasons a hotel chain, although there's some of that that goes on. Um, this is really about teaching the people who do the work what it means to do that kind of work well. And frankly, there are not a lot of opportunities on campus um, you know, to have a job like that that requires you to think on your feet and be flexible and resourceful and know a lot about a lot of stuff and talk to people all the time. Uh, I wish I'd had one of those jobs, turns out. Yeah. Um, we'll have to let you go. We're going to solve all of our financial system policy uh, issues next podcast when we have you back on. We'll, uh, we'll save that for next time. Uh, Ron, the new book out, The Price You Pay for College, also the author of The Must Read, The Opposite of Spoiled. Where do people go? They want to follow uh, what you're up to, what you're writing about, what's the best spots? Uh, ronlieber.com. That's L-I-E-B as in boy, E-R.com. Uh, you can just drop your, your first name and your email there. And I send out notes from time to time. And then I play around on the Twitter, like all of the rest of us at Ron Lieber, same hash, uh, same uh, handle on Instagram as well. We'll add the links to the show note listeners, mebfaber.com forward slash podcast. Ron, thanks so much for joining us today. It was a pleasure. Thanks for having me.